Hello students, welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Bajrav IAS Academy. So in this session, we will discuss all the important and relevant news articles they are given in the Hindu newspaper. Okay, before actually discussing all these news articles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you will get all important updates regarding our classes. So the given here list of important news articles and they are covered in the Hindu newspaper. The first news article is Sustainable Development Goals Progress in a Bhopal way. So recently Bhopal submitted the uh, voluntary review. Okay, so the local voluntary review and this local voluntary review is very important for the achieving sustainable development goals at the city level and this is first of its kind announced by the Bhopal city administration. And secondly, India's presidency at the G20 we all know and uh, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi also invited to the G7 summit which is taking place in Hiroshima. Okay, so in this context how India's G20 president uh, role could be used in the G7 summit okay, for the greater outcomes. And the next article is how Gujarat is working to become India's green hydrogen hub. So as part of this article, we will understand what is the difference between green hydrogen, blue hydrogen, gray hydrogen and brown hydrogen. They are very important and UPSC also asked a question about this. And the next article is center reverses Supreme Court order and gives LG, the Lieutenant Governor, final say or on bureaucrats. So the tussle between Delhi government and this uh, union government continues because now bypassing the Supreme Court order, center has passed an ordinance. Okay, so this ordinance has given the final say or the final power to the Lieutenant Governor for the appointment and transfer of administrators in union territory of Delhi. And the last article is limited arsenic exposure can mark cognitive ability. Now arsenic contamination is one of the major problem or the one of the major contaminant of India's groundwater along with the uranium, lead, nitrate and other pollutants. So therefore the exposure to whether it is a major exposure or the minor exposure but the exposure to arsenic will mark the cognitive abilities among children, adolescents and young populations. Now we will understand this also. Now, for example, uh, the Ganga belt is uh, highly contaminated with the arsenic. Okay, so the groundwater is highly contaminated with groundwater, for example, West Bengal and Bihar states. Okay, so we will understand all these articles in a very detailed way. So first important news article is tracking sustainable development goals progress in the Bhopal way. Now before actually discussing all these points, we need to understand what are the sustainable development goals. Okay. So these are the 17 sustainable development goals adopted by the United Nations. Okay. 17 sustainable development goals and adopted by the United Nations. Now, please go through all these sustainable development goals. Remember them so that you can use them in main answers. So when you use these sustainable development goals, you can mostly use them in conclusion, right? So that gives a better a view, a better look to your conclusion. Now, these are 17 sustainable development goals. The first one is no poverty. Second, zero hunger. Third, good health and well-being. Fourth, quality education. Fifth, gender equality. Sixth, clean water and sanitation. Second, affordable and clean energy. Eighth, decent work environment industry innovation infrastructure is the ninth goal 10th is reduced inequalities whether it is regional inequalities or income inequalities and 11th goal is sustainable cities and communities so it also com comes the solid waste management urban liquid waste management or the municipal solid waste management right and the 14th sustainable development goal is responsible consumption and production this also involves the circular economy, circular economy where we minimize the waste and we increase the scope of the products for the reuse. Okay, so this give Philip to the circular economy and the 13th goal is climate action. 14th is life below water. That means life under sea and fifth life on land uh, that includes wildlife, wild flora, fauna, etc peace, justice and strong institutions to ensure that all these goals are achieved and peace is maintained at the global level, 17 partnerships for the goals and 
no single country can achieve these goals without partnerships collaborations and active cooperation and the convergence so therefore partnership for achieving these goals is also important and that has been emphasized in sustainable development goal number 17 okay now so we have earlier discussed that the niti aayog has released a comprehensive data on the state's progress niti aayog released the comprehensive data on state's progress over the sustainable development goals okay so according to the niti aayog data on states performance over the sustainable development goals we have top 5 states okay so please remember the top 5 states and also the bottom 5 states and there is a probability that upsc may ask a question about this see the first state is kerala and second himachal pradesh tamil nadu and third place andhra pradesh goa karnataka and uttarakhand fourth place sikkim and fifth place is maharashtra okay so what are the bottom five states at the bottom it is bihar okay bihar is at the bottom and followed by jharkhand assam arunachal pradesh meghalaya rajasthan uttar pradesh and the five, the fifth position the first position from the bottom sorry the fifth position from the bottom is chatisgarh nagaland and odisha okay so please remember the top five states and bottom five states so go through these states and overall the niti aayog has classified states into four categories so what are the categories the categories include aspirant states and second category is performer states third category is front runner states and final category is achiever states so these are the states in the achiever category so those states would be included they achieve all the sustainable development goals okay so as of now there is no state in the aspirant category and also in the achiever category but most of the states are in the performer and front runner category okay so i could say that all the states are classified into performer category and front runner category for example aspirant state is a state which is not yet made any significant gains in improving the sustainable development goals or achieving the sustainable development goals so as of now there is no state which is part of the aspirant category and the second category is performer categories so there are wide variety number of states which are in the performer category for example manipur madhya pradesh west bengal chatisgarh nagaland odisha so all these states are part of the performer states okay so we could also call these states are little backward compared to other states like gujarat maharashtra karnataka andhra pradesh tamil nadu kerala okay so socio economically they are a little backward and also there is a you know income backwardness infrastructure backwardness development in terms of industries is also lacking in these states and these states are categorized as performer states now the category after the performer state is front runner category so remaining all the states are included in the front runner category for example kerala himachal pradesh tamil nadu andhra pradesh goa karnataka uttarakhand so all the better performing states are part of the front runner category now after the front runner category few states will be included in the achiever category based on their achievements okay now you set this aside come to the goal wise top states so we have discussed the sustainable development goals are total 17 goals okay so they are total 17 goals and state wise also there are different states which have been performing better on goal wise for example the goal one is no poverty okay or absence of poverty so in terms of no poverty tamil nadu and delhi were the top performers okay tamil nadu and delhi are top performers and the second goal is zero hunger in terms of zero hunger kerala and chandigarh were the top performers okay so there is no hunger or a very less hunger the population therefore kerala and chandigarh are categorized as no hunger states or zero hunger states and the third category is good health and well being okay so this is third sustainable development goal and third sustainable development goal is about good health and well being and in terms of this gujarat and delhi were top performing states and goal 4 is 
quality education in terms of quality education again kerala and chandigarh were the top performers and after that there is also a gender equality sustainable development goal number 5 and in terms of it chatisgarh andaman and nicobar islands are top performing okay so please note here that chatisgarh despite being in the performer category okay despite being in the performer category sorry uh, this is in the uh, front runner category okay so chatisgarh has been despite uh, it is considered as a backward in terms of infrastructure development or in terms of socio economic development but it has been making significant gains in terms of development and achieving the sustainable development goals and also the gender equality and goal 6 is about clean water and sanitation goa and lakshadweep have achieved or they are classified as top states in terms of ensuring clean water and sanitation okay now union government has also started the jal jeevan mission okay jal jeevan mission and the objective of this mission is to provide piped drinking water to all rural households by the year 2024 okay now kerala and go uh, lakshadweep uh, sorry goa and lakshadweep are top performing states in terms of clean water and sanitation so along with these categories please go through all other sustainable development goals and states which are better performing in these goals okay so they are very important in fact upsc cds exam 2023 so there was a question on this okay there was a question on this so which uh, of the following states were the top performers in terms of zero hunger okay so therefore go through all these sustainable development goals and the top performing states now coming to the article what this article has been discussing is about so now in the year 2015 around 193 member states of united nations they have adopted the 2030 agenda for sustainable development okay so this 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals consists of 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets okay so this is considered as a plan of action for people planet and prosperity okay because these 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets deal with a wide variety of aspects and that will cover the people planet and the prosperity as a whole okay secondly this resolution the 2030 agenda for sustainable development specifies that there will there will be mechanisms okay so these mechanisms will monitor review and report the progress the member states have made okay so the progress the member states made in achieving the sustainable development goals okay so that will be helpful in making governments accountable to the people okay so this will also help measuring the accountability of the governments to the people okay when the mechanism is set up then the mechanism will ensure that the gov- governments are accountable to the people in terms of achieving the sustainable development goals now what are those mechanisms which are specified by the resolution okay so the mechanisms are the voluntary review voluntary national review mechanism okay so this is a first mechanism voluntary national review mechanism voluntary national review mechanism now this has to be submitted to the united nations high level political forum okay so the voluntary national mechanism has to be submitted to the united nations high level political forum and along with in the similar way there is also the local okay there is also similarly voluntary local mechanism for example state uh, cities in a particular state can come up with voluntary local mechanism on achieving sustainable development goals and that will ensure the accountability of the local administration to the people okay now more recently the voluntary local review means it driving and reporting the local implementation of the sustainable development goals at the sub national level and also city level okay so this is a trend which has been developing so that the voluntary level acting or achieving sustainable development goals 
at the local level will also reflect at the national level now bhopal is actually the first in the country this is the first city in the country to declare voluntary local mechanism okay this is the first city in india to join the growing global movement on localization of sustainable development so there is a growing movement for the localization of sustainable development goals because when we act at the local level that would reflect at the national level and also at the international level so therefore there is a growing movement or the growing demand for acting at the local level okay so this is a voluntary local review and that has been adopted by the bhopal local government or the bhopal city now if you look at india's progress towards achieving all the sustainable development goals okay if you look at uh, india's overall progress india has made commendable efforts okay india have made commendable efforts towards adoption localization or achievement of the all the sustainable development goals okay in fact niti aayog has already submitted two voluntary national reviews to the united nations high level political forum okay so that was convened in the 2020 in the in this year 2020 niti aayog already submitted voluntary national review to the united nations high level political forum okay so india all india submitted two vnrs right so next india's ministry of statistics and program implementation publishing national indicator framework okay for the review and monitoring of sustainable development goals so uh, you may get this in prelims question okay uh, you may get this in prelims for example which ministry actually publishes national indicator framework for review and monitoring of sustainable development goals so it is indian india's ministry of statistics and program implementation so what is an indicator framework okay when you have to measure the you know uh, performance or the progress in a particular area you need indicators okay you need particular or certain set of indicators and these indicators for the measuring or review of sustainable development goals have been developed by ministry of statistics and program implementation and next niti aayog report according to the niti aayog report at least 23 states and union territories have prepared a vision document okay so they have a prepared a vision document and that vision document is based on the sustainable development goals and their implementation okay so almost all of the states all of them which have come up with a vision documents have initiated steps to localize the sustainable development goals so they also initiated the steps and this is actually good news for india because we are acting at the local level sub national level and at the city level and that would actually reflect at the national level now cities are the most important stakeholders so if you look at the 2011 census 2011 census almost 71 percentage of population live in rural areas rural areas and around 29 percentage of population live in urban areas so despite 29 percentage cities are the most important stakeholders in the agenda 2030 okay so this is 2030 agenda for sustainable development goals because at least 65 percentage of 169 targets which are under the sustainable development goals could not be possible or they cannot be achieved without the active participation of the city administration or without the active participation of cities and stakeholders in cities okay so therefore cities play a very crucial role a very important role okay so because in order to achieve the 65 percentage of 169 targets cities uh stakeholders and their participation is very important and next please understand the voluntary local review is actually a tool and that demonstrate how local actions are leading in a way in equitable and sustainable transformation of people okay so this largely demonstrate or reflect how local actions at the local level 
the actions which are taken by the people individuals and the administration is leading way in equitable and sustainable transformation at the local level right and it will also reflect building coalition of partners towards this endeavor overall voluntary local review now after that the cities could choose the priority for the voluntary local review processes because it is more flexible the flexibility has been given to the cities because several cities lack the capacities and they also lack the resources financial resources human resources to develop such a voluntary local review and also review or the monitor a wide set of indicators so therefore cities have been given the flexibility and they can choose the priority areas and they can choose the priority areas and they can come up with voluntary local review on those priority areas and this will incentivize in fact incentivize these cities okay so they can they can actively come up with such a voluntary local review okay and this will they will choose the priority areas for voluntary local review process and this will articulate either in terms of quantitative assessment using various city level indicators or relevant sustainable development targets okay so this is the flexibility which is being given to the cities and secondly cities may choose specific sustainable development goals for detailed review okay for example a city may consider zero hunger city may consider zero hunger or the city may consider no poverty so they can choose such a specific sustainable development goals as per their priority and logistic comfort and they can come up with the voluntary local review mechanism voluntary review voluntary local review mechanism now if we come back to the bhopal plan the bhopal's voluntary local review is actually the result of collaboration between the bhopal municipal corporation and un habitat okay so this is the collaboration between the bhopal municipal corporation and un habitat along with the 23 local stakeholders okay so this is a collaborative approach which has been taken up in bhopal now the objectives of building basic infrastructure and resilience emerge as a priority okay so the top priority of bhopal municipal corporation is providing or building basic infrastructure and resilience emerge as a priority for bhopal okay and bhopal municipal corporation or the bhopal local administration has also mapped number of projects under the sustainable development goals okay now for example sustainable development goal number 11 sustainable development goal number 7 so it says that sustainable cities and communities now bhopal has a stellar performance or you know a, a good record over the solid waste management practices public transportation and open spaces per capita okay so in terms of performance bhopal's uh, uh, bhopal's track record is you know stellar or immense performance in the so solid waste management category public transportation and open spaces per capita however this the bhopal city also has a certain gaps okay certain gaps so what are those gaps in the areas of provisioning adequate shelter high levels of air pollution in the city itself city planning capacity and even distribution and accessibility of open spaces are some of the challenges the bhopal civil administration has been facing okay so therefore it is advised that the bhopal civil administration should also look at these issues for the comprehensive development of the city and its fast pace movement towards achieving all the sustainable development goals and continuing its track record as a best performing city in a uh, country okay so that other cities could also emulate bhopal and other cities could also come up with voluntary local review mechanisms and that would be good for the overall nation because at the national level and sub national level and city level we we have separate mechanisms that ensure the uh, you know uh, local review 
and voluntarily individuals coming up more and more stakeholders are participating in achieving the sustainable development goals and that would result in socio-economic development of our cities however the article has given few examples where the cities have been coming up with such a voluntary local review mechanisms okay so those cities are uh Dhuli Kale in nepal okay this is one example and second is singra in bangladesh amman in jordan okay so they have also worked in the similar context as indian cities and they are also publishing the voluntary local review since 2022 okay however it is a remarkable opportunity for indian cities and it is expected that it is expected that the other cities will also we have a metropolitan cities like bengaluru hyderabad pune nagpur mumbai okay so these civic administrations and other cities will also follow bhopal emulate bhopal and prioritize the sustainable development goals and come up with voluntary local review mechanisms okay so this will showcase urban innovations and collaborations and emerging from india on the global map okay so india on the global map and they are emerging from india so this is all about the sustainable development goals and various states performance in terms of the sustainable development goals uh, as given by the niti ayog database on sustainable development goals and the voluntary national review and voluntary state voluntary local review and Bhopal is the only city in India to come up with voluntary local review and other cities should also follow the Bhopal's path of declaring the voluntary local review. Now jump into the next news article. The next news article is with respect to G20 summit. Okay, this is with respect to the G20 summit. G20 summit plus the G7 summit. So we all know that the 49th G7 summit is been taking place. It has been taking place Hiroshima, which is a city in Japan. Okay, so that was also hit by a nuclear bomb during the Second World War, dropped by USA. Okay, so now Prime Minister Narendra Modi invited is being invited as a, a special guest to the G7 summit, even though india is not a member of g7 india's global stature india's economic potential and india's military power and india's a larger role is duly recognized by the major countries in the world so therefore india is also being invited to the g7 meetings regularly okay so there are also uh, some uh, you know perceptions or some belief that india will become a member of g7 grouping there will be expansion of g7 grouping because of the current ukraine russia conflicts and west overtures to make india part of the g7 summit okay now first we will discuss uh, what is g7 okay we will try and understand what is g7 and then we will discuss this article and the relevance of g7 for india okay so G7 is originally known as G8. I have told you several times that G7 was once a grouping known as G G8, and uh, Russia was expelled from uh, G8 grouping, and it became G7 grouping. So it was originally known as G8 grouping, and G7 was set up in the year 1975. Okay, so the energy crisis. So after the energy crisis, the G7 was set up. And G7 was actually an informal grouping and bringing together leaders of the world's leading industrial nations. And secondly, G7 members are recognized as seven wealthiest and most advanced nations in the world. However, along with that, the summit gathers leaders from European Union and Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom and United States. So all the uh, all are the member countries of G7. Okay, all are member countries of the G7 grouping. Now, what is the purpose of setting up the G7 grouping? The purposes include G7 uh, to discuss and deliberate 
international economic issues okay it also acts in a concerted manner to help resolve other global problems with a specific focus on economic issues okay so it specially or specifically focuses on economic issues however along with that g7 fills out numerous global top lists they include their leading export countries their largest gold reserves and they also have a largest nuclear energy producers or they are also no largest nuclear producers and these g7 countries are largest or top contributors to un budget okay so recently now how g7 is expanded to z8 the group of eight so g7 responded as the global economy evolved in 1991 the soviet union pledged to create an economy with free market and held its first direct presidential election the soviet union earlier that was a communist uh, social state and in the year 1991 soviet union held its first presidential election after the fall of the soviet union now following uh, this in 1994 g7 meeting in naples russian president helps meeting with g7 member countries so that was known as p8 the political eight group in 1998 after urging from leaders including us president russia was added in the g7 grouping in the year 1998 russia was added to the g8 g7 grouping and that has become z8 however in the year 2014 russia was expelled from the g8 grouping because it annexed crimea okay so it annexed crimea after russia annexed uh, after the g7 uh, g8 group annexed uh, sorry g, uh, g8 group annexed russia and uh, the grouping has become g7 okay so g7 regularly holds summits what are the summits summits are held annually and they are hosted on a rotation basis okay so among the groups members so they are uh, they are conducted on a rotational basis or hosted on a rotational basis in the year 2000 summit was hosted by canada and this is the 49th summit and that has been hosted by japan okay now what is the significance of g7 so g7 is actually capable of setting the global agenda because a decision taken by these major economic powers have a real impact okay so the decisions taken at the g7 are not legally binding please also remember whatever decisions which are taken by the g7 are not legally binding but they exert a strong political influence on different countries and among the g7 member countries now we will try and discuss this news article what exactly this has been mentioning so we have all i have already told you that to the 49th g7 meeting prime minister narendra modi is invited as a, a special invitee okay he is actually a special invitee and prime minister narendra modi also called this as particularly meaningful okay so particularly meaningful why because india this year is a g20 president okay holding the chair of g20 so therefore the focus will be on aligning the g20 agenda with the japan's agenda for the g7 summit okay because of this reason it is particularly meaningful however along with the above mentioned reason there are uh, they also there are other reasons okay for the india's presence to stand out at the conversations so there are other important reason also and they re these reasons make india's presence to stand out okay so what are the g7 member countries the g7 member countries include us uk canada france germany italy japan and the european union right now all g7 countries have united in their efforts to condemn russia's invasion of ukraine and they have also imposed unilateral sanctions on russia against the russia's annexation or its special military operation against ukraine however so far india has not openly condemned russia's actions okay india has not openly condemned russia's actions in ukraine so therefore while trying to align the g20's agenda with the japan's agenda of g7 there is a need for india 
to take a decision on this or use some language uh, that follows the other G7 member countries. Other G7 member countries. Okay. So, so far India has also followed the path of the balancing act. Okay, so it has been balancing the interest of uh, its relation with West is with and its relation with Russia. Okay, it has followed the path of balancing act. It has been balancing the two rival groups. Okay, so this article has been suggesting that India may use some language this at this time because Ukrainian uh, President Volodymyr Zelensky uh, will also be part of G7 summit. Okay, so there is also an expectation that Volodymyr Zelensky will also meet Prime Minister Narendra Modi and there will be some discussions. In fact, Ukraine has been asking India to allow it to be part of the G20 summit this time. Okay, G20 grouping meeting this time. However, India is not in favor of that. Right, so no such outcome has been or no such decision has been made by India. However, this G7 meeting which he's been taking place or which hosted by Japan is taking place in Hiroshima, neither Russia nor China, they are actually the elephants in the big room are invited. Okay, so these two countries are not invited to the G7 meeting in Japan. However, India's position, India's position will be more important as the voice of Global South. Traditionally, India is known as the voice of the global south now the global south consists of all poor developing and underdeveloped and least developing nations in the south side okay so that includes south america or latin america africa south asia southeast asia so all these countries are together considered as global south and india is also known as the voice of the global south so therefore, India's participation in the G7 meeting as the voice of the global south is also very important. And it because how the sanctions, the unilateral sanctions which have been imposed on Russia impacting the global south. Okay, sanctions on Russia is impacting the global south, whether it is food security, fuel security or the fertilizer security. So therefore, India's voice will be very important and very crucial for the global south because these are the countries they mostly affect uh, because of this sanctions whether it is uh, with respect to food security fuel security fertilizer securities now apart from the russia ukraine war or the russia ukraine tussle india is also or uh, india will be at the forefront as g7 and g7 plus countries will discuss the debt sustainability okay so debt sustainability issue is also a major concern in recent times because more and more countries are you know under the debt trap of countries like china okay so because countries like china have been giving unsustainable uh, loans to sri lanka uh, pakistan bangladesh and myanmar so therefore india will also discuss the debt sustainability issue and it will also discuss helping countries such as Sri Lanka to avoid a debt trap. Okay, avoid a debt trap. Now, India will also be a key speaker on issues like building supply chain reliability, spearheading alternative energy coalitions and also seeking infrastructure and development aid in the region. Particularly from the G7 countries, it is very important to achieve the climate goals, we need technology transfer and also the financial support Okay, for all the countries in the global south so that these countries develop capacity over a period of time to fight climate change. However, finally it says that India's unique voice. In fact, India is one of the country which has nuclear weapons and it is a nuclear power state. In fact, India has not signed the non-proliferation treaty. India has not signed non-proliferation treaty but India has been attending a G7 meeting hosted by Japan in Hiroshima that was hit by the nuclear bomb in the year uh, so, uh, in during or world war II. okay now nuclear power that is not a member of non-proliferation treaty regime 
even though india is not a member of non proliferation treaty regime it has built an impeccable record of nuclear restraint it has built india very often reiterated its commitment for the peaceful use of nuclear weapon okay only for the peaceful uses of nuclear weapon and india has also developed a doctrine the doctrine is called as no first use policy okay no first use policy however if any country uses a nuclear weapon against india we also have the capability of massive retaliation okay so therefore india has built a, an impeccable record of nuclear restraint and it will be heard as japan seeks to send a united message uh, united message on non proliferation because from hiroshima which was devastated by american atomic bomb in the year 1945 right so this is all uh, about india's participation and what are the common issues which india is interested in the conversations with the g7 and g7 plus groupings and how these sanctions which have been imposed by uh, west has been impacting the global south okay so these are the points are very important for gs paper 2 now we need to understand the relevance of g20 group for india okay so what is the relevance of g20 group for india now between india and european union there has been a tense situation okay so for example there were many issues over these issues india and european union have been maintaining tense uh, you know ties or tense situation for example one such issue is data security and also the jammu and kashmir issue very often these countries raise the human rights violation in jammu and kashmir but in reality that is not the case okay now after that g7 group will also provide a separate forum okay g7 grouping will also provide a separate forum to discuss and debate about all these issues and resolve the differences okay this will provide an opportunity for us to resolve all these differences between us india european union and india now if you look at the g7 grouping there are three countries which are part of the united nations security council permanent members so they are us france and united kingdom so these three countries are part of united nation security council permanent members so therefore it will provides global political power to this group and which india can get benefited from this also because uh, if these three countries are members of united nation security council india has also been advocating the reforms in united nation security council expansion of the united nations security council so therefore they may soften the stand and they may also agree for expansion of the united nation security council okay so if india becomes a member of the g7 grouping it may also provide some leverage to its traditional partners okay for example yeah, india maintains close relations with several other countries and the major decisions which taken at the g7 uh uh yeah. in fact that also serves india's traditional partners okay so through organization india can promote principles like democratization of global institutions uh, in the world and uh, reforming the multilateral organizations world trade organization world bank uh, international monetary fund and also united nations security council so there will be an increased trade between g7 member countries if india becomes a part of uh european union because european union is india's second largest export destination okay so and second largest trading partner and uh, usa is the first largest uh, in fact with usa we have been maintaining the surplus balance of trade and this will provide employment opportunities and this will also give philip to the trade okay so this is all about the g7 group meeting now next uh it is uh, the next article is with respect to the how gujarat is working to become india's green hydrogen hub now before we discuss this article we need to understand what is a green energy so along with the green energy there are also different varieties of energy okay there are also different varieties of energy so what are those uh, types of energy so they are brown hydrogen gray hydrogen blue hydrogen 
and green hydrogen okay so now what is a green hydrogen because gujarat is setting up green hydrogen plant so this is hydrogen which is produced from electrolysis powered by renewable electricity or nuclear okay so hydrogen which is produced hydrogen is generally known as a clean fuel and uh, there is no uh, emission in terms of carbon emission or any other harmful gases emission so it is zero emission zero emission green hydrogen so therefore the green hydrogen is produced from the electrolysis and the electrolysis is powered by renewable electricity or nuclear energy okay so this is considered as a zero carbon energy source green hydrogen now understand what is a blue hydrogen okay what is a blue hydrogen so hydrogen which is produced using fossil fuels but co2 is captured okay so when we produce uh, hydrogen and we produce hydrogen using the fossil fuels okay fossil fuels like natural gas petroleum uh, such fossil fuels coal so we use such fossil fuels however they also generate co2 but while producing hydrogen CO2 is generated and this CO2 is captured and stored. So therefore, the impact on the environment is also very low. However, it is not considered as zero carbon, but it is rather considered as lower carbon because we are using fossil fuels and it also emits the carbon dioxide, but the carbon dioxide is captured. So therefore, blue hydrogen is lower carbon. And apart from this, there is another variety of of carbon hydrogen so that is gray hydrogen so gray hydrogen is produced using fossil fuels neither uh, stored the co2 okay co2 is not stored in this not captured and not stored uh, in the category of gray hydrogen and gray hydrogen while producing gray hydrogen we use fossil fuels okay fossil fuels and it has a higher carbon intensity and last is brown hydrogen this hydrogen is produced by a product of produced as a product of industrial processes so in the industrial processes itself whether we use fossil fuels whether we use fossil fuels or natural gas natural gas but this hydrogen the brown hydrogen is produced as a product of industrial processes process of industrial processes and this is also considered as higher carbon intensity energy now please remember brown hydrogen and gray hydrogen are considered as higher carbon uh, sources of uh, energy and blue hydrogen is low carbon energy and green hydrogen is zero carbon energy okay now we need to discuss this article now this article has been uh, saying that gujarat has set to become the country's green hydrogen manufacturing hub okay so uh, what is a green hydrogen green hydrogen production of hydrogen okay production of hydrogen you by electrolysis okay electrolysis either by renewable energy or with nuclear energy okay so there is zero carbon emitted from the green hydrogen technology so therefore gujarat has set to become countries green hydrogen manufacturing hub and retain a dominance over the industrial sector and recently the state has signed memorandum of understandings with reliance adani arcelormittal and torrent so they have pledged a huge investments in green hydrogen especially the green hydrogen right so the projects have been allotted the land also the land has also been allocated by the gujarat government for these projects so the total aim of the project is to make gujarat a hub for green hydrogen okay so also creating a production capacity of 8 million metric 8 metric tons per annum by the year 2035 so this is one of the aims of the project so the the green hydrogen manufacturing project which has been taken up in gujarat now along with that in compliance with the above mentioned Uh, objectives in order to achieve the above mentioned objectives the state is framing new policy for green hydrogen manufacturing and that will be given the status of a priority sector 
now when it given a priority sector and it is eligible for loans okay it is eligible for loans and favorable policies from the state government and allocation of land at a subsidy prices okay and even infrastructure will be created and power will be given at a discounted price however along with the above mentioned provisions the government will provide a range of incentives to these industries and they are particularly investing in green hydrogen projects okay so now india have a set of uh, india announced a set of commitments as part of the cop 26 glasgow summit so one of the commitments is under the nationally determined contributions india has set to uh, india has set a target of becoming the net zero emission country by the year 2070 okay india has announced a target of becoming the net zero emission by the year 2070 okay so the country also aims to reduce the carbon emissions by 45 percentage by 2030 okay by sourcing 50 percent of its energy from the renewable sources and these commitments are also known as panchamrut commitments because they are five commitments so we will discuss what are those commitments okay so in fact the union budget 22 or uh, 23 24 union budget 23 24 also allocated around 19744 crore for national green hydrogen mission okay so india announced national green hydrogen mission and for this green hydrogen mission the center has allocated around 19 lakh 744 crore and they seek to promote development of green hydrogen production capacity of at least 5 million metric tons per annum okay so they are the objectives of the national green hydrogen mission okay so along with the above mentioned objective or above mentioned aim so the center has also focused on increasing the renewable energy capacity addition of 175 gigawatts in the country by 2030 so in addition to this the policy aims to attract an investment of 8 lakh crore and create employment opportunities for 6 lakh or create 6 lakh jobs by the year 2030 okay so this is all about the national green hydrogen mission and panchamrut commitments and also the gujarat's intentions to attract investments in green hydrogen mission okay now we we have discussed what is a brown a brown hydrogen gray hydrogen blue hydrogen and green hydrogen so please remember all these types or all these categories of hydrogen okay now next we will discuss india's panchamrut okay so india's panchamrut so i have already told you that prime minister narendra modi announced uh, in the cop cop 26 glasgow meet glasgow meet prime minister narendra modi announced five commitments five commitments so so what are those commitments which are part of intended nationally determined contributions okay so the first commitment uh, which india made was develop non fossil fuel energy capacity to reach 500 gigawatt by 2030 okay so we will develop the non fossil fuel energy capacity to reach 500 gigawatt by 2030 secondly meet 50% of country's energy requirements by renewable energy the 50% of total our energy requirements will be met through renewable energy and reduce the total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion ton now between now and 2030 and fourth the carbon intensity of the economy will be less than 45% by 2030 and finally achieve net zero emissions by 2070 so all these five commitments are known as the panchamrut commitments okay so please remember all these commitments or if possible make note of these commitments now we should also discuss about the national hydrogen mission okay national hydrogen mission so the national hydrogen mission is under the nodal Uh, is, uh the nodal ministry for the national green hydrogen mission is ministry of new and renewable energy so don't confuse it with ministry of science and technology or ministry of power it is under the ministry of new and renewable energy so what are the objectives of national green hydrogen mission okay so the objectives include decarbonize energy and industrial mobility sector so decarbonize will give a fillip to the 
net zero emission or a carbon neutral economy. And secondly, develop indigenous manufacturing capacities rather than depending on imports. Okay. Third, create export opportunities for green hydrogen and its derivatives across the globe. And what are the components which are part of national green hydrogen mission? So there are two components. The first component is strategic interventions for green hydrogen and transition program. And this is also known as site. And the second program is strategic hydrogen innovation partnership ship program. Okay, strategic hydrogen innovation partnership, right? Now, the expected outcomes from the national green hydrogen mission include at least at least the green, uh, green hydrogen annual production achieving 5 million metric tons, 5 million metric tons of green hydrogen annual production. This is the first set of objective. And the second objective is 1 lakh crore fossil fuel import reduction. Okay, saving of 1 lakh crore fossil fuel import. And third objective is 6 lakh jobs by the year 2030. And 50 million metric tons, 50 million metric tons of CO2 annual emissions will be averted and attracting around 8 lakh crore investments. Okay, so these are the some of the set objectives. Okay, so but if you understand the current scenario of hydrogen E, the green hydrogen is not commercially viable at present. Because the current cost of India is around 350 to 400 kilograms. Okay, 350 to 400 kilograms. So this is not more viable. Now, the National Hydrogen Energy Mission aims to bring down the cost under 100 uh, rupees per kilogram over a period of time. Okay, so the difference between hydrogen and green hydrogen. Now, hydrogen is most common element in nature but it exists only in combination with other elements. For example, water, H2O, okay? So it is most abundant in nature, but it exists only in combination with other elements. It has to be extracted from uh, naturally occurring compounds like water. So we need to extract hydrogen from water, okay? Hydrogen from water, okay? Now, uh, we have already understood what is a green hydrogen, brown hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen okay so green hydrogen is made by splitting water through electrical processes called electrolysis and this uses the renewable energy and this is called as green hydrogen and it releases zero emissions into the or zero carbon into the atmosphere okay so this is all about the national green hydrogen mission now the next article is with respect to the arsenic contamination okay so arsenic contamination now in india the contamination of groundwater is a major problem for example there are uh, elements like fluoride uranium okay fluoride uranium lead arsenic are major contaminants are major contaminants in india when it comes to arsenic uh, the eastern um, india and the ganga belt is mostly uh, contaminated with arsenic okay mostly contaminated with arsenic now before actually discussing this article first we need to understand the water crisis and the water stress which india has been facing okay now india has been facing the depleting groundwater level uh, you know because of the contamination and exploitation and indiscriminate use of water okay so it says that the number of wells showing fall in groundwater level is around 5,699 and number of wells showing rise in groundwater level is 4,450. Okay, number of wells showing no change is 70. So other important facts related to water usage in India is India has accounted for around 80 percentage population. Okay, India accounts for around 80 percentage population but it has only 4 percentage of water resources of the world okay so the annual per capita availability of water decreases from 6004 uh, to 42 cubic meters in the year 1947 to just 1545 cubic meter availability of water in the year 2011 now annual per capita availability of water was 1816 cubic meters in the year 2001 okay so there has been a drastic and a significant decline in per capita availability of 
water okay so apart from this the annual per capita availability of water we further reduced to 1340 cubic meters in the year 2025 and in the year 1 2050 it will be further reduced to 1140 okay if there is a you know a decline in availability of water and there is a probability that people will uh, uh, have a less water okay less water for usage or for drinking purposes and they may very often use the contaminated water and using contaminated water will result in several diseases or problems okay now so what are the contaminants in the waters the contaminants include nitrate fluoride highest contaminant is nitrate so that is followed by new fluoride and second third iron fourth salinity fifth arsenic sixth lead chromium cadmium so please remember all these pollutants upsc may ask a question about uh, the pollutants which are in india's waters okay so the pollutants include nitrate fluoride iron salinity arsenic lead chromium and cadmium okay so the presence of these elements in groundwater beyond the permissible levels in different or number of districts in india okay however lead cadmium and chromium are considered as heavy metals in groundwater okay now what this article is talking about this is actually about the arsenic contamination okay this is about the arsenic contamination and how this contamination has been impacting the cognitive abilities of child cognitive abilities of adult and child so so it is very well known that ingesting high levels of arsenic from contaminated groundwater in india has been linked to a range of ailments okay so high arsenic contamination and drinking water with a, such a contamination uh, drinking would result in a wide range of ailments and it suggests that even low levels of arsenic consumption will also impact the cognitive function in children adolescent and young adults so even a minute amount of uh, arsenic will also impact the cognitive function among children okay so those exposed to arsenic had a reduced gray matter and this gray matter is a brain tissue and that is very vital for cognitive functions and secondly it will also result in weaker connections with the key regions of the brain and that will enable the concentration okay so there will be a weaker connections uh, with the key regions for example switching between tasks temporary storage of information etc so therefore high levels of arsenic or the low levels of arsenic so both have the impacts on the cognitive abilities of children adolescents and young adults however the arsenic contamination is widespread in states like west bengal bihar uttar pradesh and assam so therefore since 1990s both center and governments like west bengal and bihar have sought to address the arsenic contamination now how they are planning to address the arsenic contamination through a common strategy they have employed that is encouraging the pipe water access rather than the groundwater extraction and also installing the arsenic removal plants so this some way will remove the arsenic contaminated water or treat the arsenic contamination in the water okay so this is all about the arsenic contamination and how it has been impacting the cognitive functions of children okay now the next article is with respect to the conflict between or the tussle between the delhi and delhi and uh, union government okay union government so in our previous classes we have discussed that uh, there was recently a dispute between the central government and the delhi admins delhi government okay so that is with respect to the administrative control of the bureaucrats in the uh, national capital territory of delhi the center says the delhi government have no control over the civil servants however delhi government says they have the control over the appointment and transfer of the civil servants or the bureaucrats okay so the constitution bench recently delivered a judgment on that that is who have the control over the administration in delhi so the constitution bench of the supreme court says that lieutenant governor is actually bound by the minister's aid and advice okay so the court says that the elected government of delhi has 
the legislative power over the city's services okay city services means city's bureaucrats they have the legislative power so that it can control officers executing its policies the delhi government should control or have the power to control the officers executing the policies of the delhi government secondly the supreme court also reiterated that lieutenant governor is bound by the aid and advice of the government's council of ministers council of ministers and except in the matters of public order police and land okay now what this effectively means this effectively means that the state government will be in control of appointing and transferring officers in delhi administration okay so this power has so far exercised by the lieutenant governor okay so this power is so far exercised by the lieutenant governor however the current scenario is recently so recently the delhi government uh, the union government passed a legislation okay uh, sorry an ordinance they have come up with an ordinance center government come up with an ordinance so this ordinance says that the appointment and the transfer of the civil servants again given to the lieutenant governor okay so the appointment and transfer of the uh, uh, you know bureaucrats is again given to the lieutenant governor through this ordinance now if you look at this news article the union government fine friday uh, sorry so union government friday brought an ordinance designing lieutenant governor as the administrator of delhi okay so he will have a final say on it uh, whether it is about the postings or transfer of all bureaucrats serving in delhi government okay so this ordinance also seeks to amend the government of national capital territory of delhi act 1991 okay so this ordinance also seeks to establish the national capital services authority okay so the national capital services authority is headed by the chief minister of delhi with the chief secretary of uh, with the chief secretary and principal home secretary as members of national capital services authority now all matters required to be decided by the authority shall be decided by majority of votes of the members present and voting in case of uh, an appointment or the transfer of uh, bureaucrats and that will be decided by the national capital services authority however the role of the national capital services authority is that it only recommend the appointment and transfer of bureaucrats to the lieutenant governor and the ultimate the ultimate uh, you know decision will be taken by the lieutenant governor over the appointment or transfer of the administrators and this ordinance will further complicate the matters between the delhi government and the center okay so for example the lieutenant governor may deny the recommendations of the national capital services authority uh okay so therefore this will further uh, you know further intensify the differences over uh, differences between the delhi government and the union government so these are all the important and relevant news articles for today's discussion okay so thank you so much